Hello, Sean. All right. Nice. How are well, you? This is really exciting. Uh, I'm doing I'm, I'm doing pretty good. Um, sure. I'm in Portland right now. I, like I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, these fires, uh, you can't even go outside. Like you spend mm -hmm. any amount of time, you just feel it in your eyes, your lungs. It's awful. And especially right now, I'm just like, I, I, I'm getting stir crazy here. I'm used to walking every day and now it's just can't do anything. So mm -hmm. I guess, you know, considering what's gone on the past year, it's not I'm just kind of catching up with the other, the way other people feel uh, with COVID and all that shit. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, but you know, doing well. That's good. That's good. Yeah. So, uh, so for everybody listening, since we are recording this. Um, so uh, can you just go into what you've been doing for the last, what, four months, three months? How long you've been hiking? Well, let's see. I, I wrapped things up uh, August 25th, I think. Uh, I was about 230 miles short of finishing the Appalachian Trail, and I fell and hurt my knee and was just like, that's it. But I've been mm -hmm. hiking for over seven months. Seven um, months? Seven months, 4,650-ish miles. Um, all of the PCT and like I said, like, what is it? 90, 95% of the Appalachian trail. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, that's what I've been doing for this past year. Uh, started January, January 19th at, uh, Amiclola Falls State Park and just, uh, kept walking. Oh, okay. So where, where is that state park? Is that in Georgia? Did you start? So that's, in, that's in Georgia. Uh, mm -hmm. I believe it's about an hour, hour and a half north of uh, of um, Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and uh, you, there's Amicola Falls State Park, and there's like an eight mile uh, trail that you have to take to actually get to Springer Mountain. Right. So, you know, you. I started out. I woke up in the morning at a shelter at the park. There's this little spot there, and you, you walk underneath the arch. Um, and that's kind of like the official, unofficial, official, official start. I mean, some people don't count the extra eight miles, but it's, I mean, you're walking a couple thousand miles doesn't really matter. Um, and then you get to Springer Mountain, there's the first plaque, uh, and there the journey begins. There you, there you go. And you were flying between the East Coast and the West Coast then? Yeah. The so I guess I kind of explain the logistics of things. Um, yeah. So the original plan was, you know, I was going after a calendar year Triple Crown, which is hiking the Appalachian Trail, the Pacific Crest Trail, and the Continental Divide Trail. Mm -hmm. That was a label I put on to it just to kind of make it easier to explain. But, you know, I just kind of wanted to see how far I could hike. Um, mm -hmm. I hiked the Pacific Northwest Trail last year. Okay. Um, and at the end of that, I was like 1,200 miles. Like, my body was really broken after that, but I still, like, like I want to push myself further. So... I just decided I was going to try all three and see what happens. So I started uh, the Appalachian Trail January 19th, and the plan was always to hike up to Harriman State Park, which is outside of New York City. Uh, it's about mile 1385, I believe, um, and then be able to fly from when I flew from JFK to San Diego um, to start the uh, Pacific Crest Trail and just did the first 600 miles of that um just that's basically the desert section but still so, way too you walk to harriman state park i've been i've been to that part of the appalachian trail so you walk to new york state from georgia between the months of january and march 21st i was on the on the pacific crest trail yeah there's, there's snow there's snow in the mountains right there there was snow but most of it was in um through the smokies okay um there I had a good eight inches of snow, which wasn't even the worst. It actually snowed more after I left that. And there are other people who went through like a couple feet of snow. So I will say I've been pretty lucky with my uh, weather. Um, there was some sections in New England that really slowed me down a mm -hmm. lot. Um, but uh, I guess we can go into that a little bit later. Uh, but okay, yeah, so I mean, it wasn't as bad. The cold weather... The cold weather and stuff, I mean, I grew up in Michigan. Um, I lived on the East Coast in Philadelphia for 16 years. Like, I know how to deal with that that kind of weather and that, you know, that coldness and that snow. So it was just kind of, I was well prepared. Um, but, it, I mean, if you don't know what you're doing, it definitely can be a sketchy situation. What? Okay, so we're using, you're using a tent, 
uh, what, 20 degree sleeping bag, 10 degree sleeping bag? I had, so it, it, the, the hiking started out colder. I think like the first night I was on trail, it was zero degrees. So okay. I had a, um, a 20 degree quilt, but then would supplement that with a 40 degree quilt. And then I had a sleeping bag liner. And on top of that, I had like an enlightened equipment, like their apex jacket and pants. Yeah. Um, and you know, it worked. I wouldn't say it was like the most comfortable kind of sleeping, but you know, I didn't freeze to death. So it worked. Okay. And you did that until March, you say 26th? 20, 21st, March 21st, 21st, I believe. Yeah, I flew, I woke up in a shelter that morning uh, and this uh, trail angel, real nice guy picked me up. I stayed at his place and he drove me to JFK, which worked out better because that's when COVID was really starting to hit the fan. Mm -hmm. And so I, my original plan was to take, you know, a train across Manhattan to get to JFK in the height of the insanity. Uh, but luckily this guy gave me a ride and flew out to San Diego, got a, an Uber ride to Campo, which is the, the Southern terminus of DCT. And 3 PM that afternoon, I was starting that, uh, trail. Okay, so so you hike the desert section of the PCT, and and then what? So the so the idea is to get to hit the weather windows appropriately. Like I didn't want to get into New England too early, mm -hmm. um, but I you know and then on the desert section of the PCT, I didn't want to hit that too late. Um, mm -hmm. But you get to a point where you enter the Sierra, which is about mile seven hundred technically or whatever. Like okay. ideally, you don't want to go into there before June. Um, snow, I mean, a lot of this is snow dependent, um, what the snow levels are, but so that was the goal of like, okay, I'm just going to hike this desert section when it's relatively cool. I don't have to worry about long water carries, um, you know, get that done, fly back over, uh, hit, get back on the AT, finish that, fly back, finish the PCT, and then, um, start the plan was to start the CDT southbound. If I got that far, if I still wanted to you know, keep hiking that much. Right. Um, but it didn't quite work out like that. Um, I got hit some crazy snow uh, in New England that slowed me down a lot. There was, I was having, uh, I wasn't eating enough food and compound mm -hmm. that with cold temperatures. You're like, your body just like burns through calories. What so, month is this now? Um, I believe it was April. Okay. So I don't think I, I spent more than a month on the PCT. Okay. Um, yeah. And yep. So April, and then I got through most of the uh, New England section. I got, um, I summited Mount Washington. Uh, well, so I started going through the whites, and there was already about in April. Uh, I think it was in April. You go walking yeah. through the white. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I did some things that I don't recommend, but got some really good footage so, from. If, if anybody doesn't know what the, the White Mountains are, they're in New Hampshire, and uh, they're not the, so uh, compared to the Sierra Nevadas. They're what? What's Mount Washington? Five thousand, eight thousand feet? Uh, Five thousand something. Five thousand feet. I think. Yeah. yeah. It's only, so it's only five thousand feet, which doesn't sound like a whole lot, but the weather patterns there are the literally the craziest weather patterns in the cold in the entire country. They'll get hundred mile an hour winds. It snows there every month out of the year, and you're going there in spring, which is probably the worst weather you can get besides like the middle of January or February. So okay, so you're you're in the whites. It, it obviously it's snowing on you. Well, yeah, there was already a lot of snow. I had pretty good weather going through until the day before. Yeah, um, and also remember that all of the huts were closed. Oh right, right. So uh, the Day before summiting uh, Washington, I slept outside of um, Mitzvah Hut, something like that. I don't mm -hmm. remember the name. Um, with and that's like six miles to the summit. It snowed that night like six inches, and it was. I got up in the morning, and it was all. I mean, I was just socked in with clouds and some pretty strong winds. And I said, "Well, I know there's an emergency shelter at Lake of the Clouds. It's always open, and if I need to do that, I can." Otherwise, I got warm clothes, just keep moving. And, you know, it's not 
there weren't more storms predicted to come through that day. So I decided to charge through. Um, and I, I, I could not see the summit of Washington until like 200 yards out. It was, so, it was just crazy. Like the, the wind was super intense. Everything had horizontal icicles coming off of it. So oh, it looked wow. like that ice planet. What is it? Hoth? in uh, mm-hmm. Star Wars, <laughs> it, was, it was like another world up there. Um, and my beard, like my hair, everything was frozen. And it was just so cold too, that like any moisture on my jackets and stuff were freezing. Um, and I was, I was comfortable, but it was the edge of, you know, safe. Uh, I don't recommend anybody doing that the way I did it, unless you're right. like, well prepared. Right. Um, I mean, of all the hiking that I did, that I, I mean, I didn't feel like I was in any real danger. I mean, I respect how easy it is for the mountain to kill you. I mean, there's a sign you're walking up there and it basically says it'll fucking kill you on a good day. Mm -hmm. Um, And that thing was just caked in ice um, and I'm going over Mount Washington. So uh, Lake of the Clouds. Oh yeah, so I got to that hut and it was like the whole thing was submerged in water and had been frozen. So it had this huge snow drift over it and there was ice about halfway up where the door to the emergency shelter was. Mm -hmm. So it's a good thing I didn't have to use it because I wouldn't have been able to. Oh, wow. It was literally frozen shut. It was frozen shut. It was like in an ice cube. Like that's, it's like a whole lake was around it. I guess Lake of the Clouds hut, you know, and it's totally frozen. Wow. Holy crap. Okay, so you get through the whites and then what, you go back to California? So I got through the whites and uh, I got to Gorm and stayed in a hostel there. Uh, and the uh, later that uh, that day or later that night, another snowstorm came through and dumped a whole boatload of snow. And I was thinking, okay, that's fine. I can deal with snow. I don't have to go through, you know, Mount Washington again. Like I got the worst part out of the way, um, except that. So I went and picked up some snowshoes and then took off the day after. I ended up getting to a crossing over, hiking 17 miles in, crossing over into Maine. um, And then I started to have gear issues and I was getting wet and I couldn't get it dry and actually got to the top of this mountain just after the border. And unfortunately, or fortunately, I had to hit my SOS button and get directed out because of I had seal skin socks on, but they were failing and my feet were going numb and I couldn't hike forward. Hike, hiking forward was another 14 miles through uh, Grafton Notch, like the hardest mile of the AT. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then back was 17 miles, but it was all through snow and my feet just were not going to be able to take it. Fortunately, I mean, it all ended fine. Uh, they directed me down a side trail like straight down the mountain. And as soon as I dropped a couple hundred feet, the snow actually like disappeared. It was fine. It was just like that higher elevation where the trail is at. So anyways, I got back to Gorm and I was like, that's it. I'm done with snow. I hate this. Uh, I'm going to go finish the PCT and come back to this when I'm done with that. So that's what I did. I uh, got a ride to Boston and um, flew over to the PCT and started up there and yeah, and then wrapped that up. Wow. So you, did you go right into the Sierra Nevadas then from Maine? Basically. I had, a, yeah, I had a couple of days of hiking to get to, uh, Kennedy Meadows South, mm-hmm. um, which is kind of the entry to the Sierra. Um, so, you know, I had a couple of days, four days, I think three days, it was four days. And then, yeah, I just entered the Sierra and it, I, it was de- like a week before guys on Mount Whitney, uh, the 28th, May 28th. So maybe four days before that or something. I don't, it all kind of blurs together now, but I actually went into Sierra before June because the snow conditions looked favorable and, uh, they were dry. It, there was a huge heat wave going through and the snow levels were just dropping rapidly. So, yeah. Yeah. So how did the snow compare? Cause you, you're obviously walking on snow still in the Sierra Nevadas, but how does that compare to the East coast? When well, it. you know, some parts were easier. Um, but so when I was on the East Coast walking over like three feet of like old base snow, like I was just cruising right over. I'd wear spikes, but, you know, I could just walk right over. But in the Sierra, you got these uneven melts. 
So there was a lot of post tolling, especially, you know, you hit a pass at a certain time of day or close to a creek um, because of all the runoff, the snow melt is just shooting underneath. So, you know, it's really easy to break right through. Um, I'd say it's a little bit heavier uh, in the Sierra than uh, on the East Coast, just as more water content. Um, but I had, I had clear skies and almost perfect weather for my entire hike of the PCT. So wow. the, the biggest concern, I think, was one, hitting the passes like in the morning, which I managed to do, but also getting sunburn and snow blindness could have been an issue too, because it's just clear skies all day. Right. Um, and that's, that sun just coming up from the snow just like burns your face real quick. So no, no fires or anything? When you're out no there, fires. Nope, they held off until a couple of weeks ago. So I actually know a couple of people who are doing the trail southbound, and, um, and actually one guy uh, who was doing the same thing that I was doing, but reversed, and he had to get off trail permanently because they pretty much closed the trail all through California and most of Oregon. Right, right. Uh, so yeah, it's just for posterity's sake, it's uh, September 11th and 2020, and these fires are the worst they've ever seen. In California and Oregon isn't much better, and Washington isn't much better. And, and you're saying you're seeing the smoke in Portland. I'm seeing the smoke here in Boise. So yeah. I mean, it's yeah. It looks like the apocalypse, pretty much. Yeah. And this isn't even the worst. I guess like San Francisco and some other places, even along the coast where the smoke has just been going directly that way, mm -hmm. really awful. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's unfortunate. But usually this this happens earlier in the season, and for the past couple of years, it's been later and later. So I guess that's the silver lining. There you go. Uh, so, okay. So what date did you finish the PCT? I start, I finished August, August 18th. Right. August Cause it was almost, yeah. I initially planned to do it almost finish seven months on the dot of hiking, but I crushed out a really long day. So to be mm -hmm. able to finish it up a day before. And then after finishing the PCT, did you, you didn't go back to Maine? So I went back to Maine. Yeah, I picked yeah. it up, picked up the trail where uh, I left off and I was ready to go, but I, the, it was so humid. It was like, the, I was only on the AT for three days. Uh, yeah. The third day I was walking along, going down this, this mountain and, you know, unlike the PCT, you know, switchbacks for days, you know, mm -hmm. you have 15 miles of switchbacks, but on the AT, that'll just go right up the spine and like over the peak and then right down the, you know, whatever side it wants to go. And so it's super rugged. And I slipped, I was trying to step down these rocks. And I just slipped and like, I was able to land on my feet, but I landed on my toes in a way that kind of just put all this pressure, like up into my knees. And I, luckily there's a, there's a road like a mile away. So I was able to hitch into a town, um, Rangely, I think it's called. Yeah. And fishing in Rangeley. Yeah, yeah. I was, the guy who picked me up was talking about fishing there a lot. So yeah. uh, nice, nice little spot. But I, at that point, like I knew the pain was just not good and it wasn't going away. So, I mean, it's good now. I think if I would have waited around for a week, week and a half, I could have gotten back out. But, you know, honestly, I just didn't want to wait around. I wasn't patient enough to do that. And that's coming. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's funny that I walk 12, 14 miles or hours a day and I'm not patient to sit around for a week and a half to wait for my knees to heal to finish the AT. But, you know, I just wanted to get things moving. I was like, you know, here's the sign. I've hiked this many miles. Mm -hmm. I'm happy with that, you know. So I just kind of threw in the towel. I'd like to go back and finish uh, eventually. Um, mm -hmm. But, yeah, it was, felt like it was done. I mean, that, that's plenty of months. That's, uh, that's yeah, plenty. It's long. Yeah. So, okay, so so it's interesting. We connected originally because right when this whole pandemic scare situation occurred, the the PCTA, the Pacific Crest Trail Association, the Appalachian Trail Association, they're telling people to get off the trail, don't hike this year, don't be out there, you know, don't put extra strain on these communities. Uh, and you were one of the few guys who were like, you, got, you, you just kept hiking. It didn't affect Ooh. you at all. I saw, I saw no reason to stop. First of all, okay. I respect the PCTA. I respect the ATC, what they're doing, their mission. They're important for that, for the trails to exist. CDT, uh, you know, all, all of them. However, I think that they went 
outside of their lane to tell hikers, first of all, false information that the trails were closed. They're not the governing agencies of the trail. So that's like the forest service, like they're the ones who can close the trail. But mm -hmm. regardless, I mean, it, they did what they did. And uh, yeah, I was like, no, I'm gonna stay on trail because first I've quit my job. I've moved out of my apartment. I've pretty much torn everything up my life in Philly to be able to do this. Mm -hmm. I had friends and family also telling me to like, don't, don't come back to the city. Like, don't come back here, stay on the trail because I mean, there's nobody around there. Where else? I mean, I, I can't think of a better place to be when there's a, a pandemic going around being spread right. by being around people. Right. And even, even when there's a lot of people on the trail, like you you still don't have that, that much contact. Um, so yeah, I just pushed right through. I got some negative, uh, kickback on like, you know, instant me or social media and things like mm -hmm. that, but man, that those, I mean, I don't know those people. So, you know, right. that, that didn't affect me. It was kind of entertaining. It was kind of fuel for the fire too. I, I'm, I'm a bit stubborn and people telling mm -hmm. me not to do something. I'm like, <laughs> watch me. I'm going to go do this. Sure. Um, as, as far as resupplying, you know, I started going through, I did feel anxiety about, you know, everything going on and just like, what am I going to do? But, you know, I figured, you know, grocery stores, gas stations, places where you resupply, they're essential services, laundromats, essential services. So I can get all my food. I can charge my devices at laundromats. I can clean my clothes. I don't need anything else. Hostels are nice. Hotels are nice, but I don't need any of those things. Um, so I just, you know, it was always a I always, I, I'm, I'm a big supporter of uh, radical self-reliance, especially mm -hmm. when you're out on trail like that, you know, don't mm -hmm. rely on anybody except yourself. Sure, accept help from others, but you need to be prepared to last on your own. So that's what I did. And, you know, I had a very fulfilling trail experience, both on the AT and the PCT. And I think a lot of that is because there weren't a lot of people on trail. Now, I will say if, Everybody, I, I think me and a couple other people that stayed on trail, that only worked because 99% of the people that were going to hike got off trail. So I've been accused of being selfish for continuing to hike. Sure, mm. that's fine. I'll take that. Um, but yeah, it only works when most people, you know, got off. Otherwise, I mean, I could see a situation where things would spread easier. Although, you know, we also worry about things like Giardia and other... <laughs> Right, uh, I mean, related, it, it, the norovirus spreads every season, yeah. but right. no one ever talks about getting off trail. And that's that, that's a terrible disease. That's way worse than COVID. I mean, you have a fever for two or three days. You're if if you don't know what it is, it's you're you're expelling every liquid from your body, and whatever the survival rate is on norovirus is certainly not. <laughs> no, it's definitely well, worse than COVID, depending on your age group. <laughs> well, it, it's true. I I did uh, get Giardia in oh, wow. Washington. So I had to get a week, I had to get off trail for a week yeah. just to recover from that, um, which and it was a terrible, awful experience. Um, yeah. Really knocked me down. Uh, but you know, it, there were people, especially in California, there's a lot of, I'd say individuals who wanted to be on their soapbox and yell at people like, don't come to the town, it's closed, like all this stuff. I mean, and the problem with social media is that people would focus on that when in reality these people in these small towns wanted hikers to come in they just didn't you know they weren't going to be the ones to stand up and be like no we want you to come so there's a lot of false information and then you have to get your information from word of mouth um and even on the facebook pages uh like pct the class of 2000 or 2020 and the pct page just turned into like a cesspool like hikers on uh, going after other hikers for continuing to hike and not sheltering in place they shut down the at page which both of these things were huge sources of information for me to, to get around and luckily there were still hiking pages uh started um that were you know focused on people who are still hiking to get them the information they needed and wow. so you did find that there were a lot of people, a lot of trail angels who still wanted to help the best they could, even if that was just, you know, social, bringing something out to you, but staying socially distant. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I, early on, I was trying to hitch a ride into Julian 
I didn't even have to stick out my thumb. Like some, <laughs> this old guy drove his pickup truck up and, you know, it asked me if I needed a ride, Julian. I was like, yeah, sure, absolutely. And he, he was old and he started telling me, and he was smoking a pipe at the same time. And he started telling me how he wasn't going to let no virus take him out. He probably only had about three years to live anyway. So, you know, there were people who just didn't, you know, give a shit what was going on. They were still going to do what they wanted to do. Um, You know, kind of double-edged sword. There's definitely, you know, later on, you know, we were all wearing face masks. Once we learned that that was the way that, you know, you had to wear a mask going to the store, things like that. So we, me and other hikers, you know, we all respected those kinds of, you know, rules and stuff the best we could. Uh, but, you know, people were really nice on trail. I, mm-hmm. did, I, hadn't co- I did not come across a single person in real life that had anything negative to say about my hiking. I mean, and people would just say, you know, keep on hiking, don't stop. It's like, yeah. you got it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So it must have been, you know, of all the years to hike, this is going to be a standout here just because there, you know, like you were saying, you're saying it was close to 90% of people dropped off. So I, I mean, I, there were probably, some people said there were only, there were less than 200 people attempting a through hike on the PCT. Wow. Um, I don't know about the numbers for the AT. Um, yeah. I think a lot more people, a lot more people have gotten back on. And mm-hmm. finish the AT, but I mean, obviously, the numbers are nowhere near what they are in a normal year. Wow, um, this is well, not anymore. But you know, this was the year if you wanted to experience a long trail like the AT or the PCT in its purest form. Like this is it. You know, you don't have mm-hmm. to fight for resources. You don't have to deal with a bunch of people in shelters snoring. Um, you know, norovirus spreading around. Uh, not getting the, you know, a good campsite. Uh, I mean, I was able to, you know, just get amazingly beautiful campsites all along the PCT, uh, where there was nobody. And I can't imagine during like a full year, like when you have thousands of hikers on it, like right. having to just, uh, you know, you hike all day and there's all these people there already because they're not doing the same miles mileage that you are. And, you know, you got to keep on going. Right. So it's a good year to be out in the woods. It sounds it sounds like it was the best year to, to, to be hiking. The best year. Yeah. Yeah. Oh wow. That's that's really amazing. Uh well Sean, uh really thank you for sharing that with me. Uh, absolutely. You know, and I I think this is an important conversation to have. One, not only because of this the insane miles that you did do, but also the climate that we're in. Like how many how many classes of through hikers had to hike through a pandemic? and kind of deal with the repercussions and actually be on the ground. I mean, you started hiking before it started. You're in the woods while it started. It's kind of like a fantasy that a lot of hikers have. You know, what if the world <laughs> ended all out here? Yeah. And that could have happened for you. Yeah, it was <laughs> – I mean, I I had joked about uh, when I was going through, oh, I don't know, Shenandoah, I think I was—I kind of joked around because COVID was just starting to spread rapidly in China, and yeah. I kind of, i walked out on the road and there was like nobody, and I kind of imagined like, wow, I could be in the woods for a couple of weeks and pop out and like this is what the apocalypse would be, and I wouldn't even know it yet. Like COVID just ravaged through everything, and I was joking at the time, but yeah. that was—that was it. I mean, there was section if in New England, especially. I didn't see anybody for days. I think I went a week maybe without seeing anybody, which is, yeah. is tough. Yeah. I mean, it was, uh, Massachusetts into Vermont and New Hampshire. I don't you I went, think it was main. I think it was mainly in Vermont uh, going into New Hampshire. Where, you went through the long trail in Vermont and didn't see anybody? When I, I didn't see anybody on the long trail. <laughs> yep. I've never even heard of it. I lived in Vermont and I don't even know of a month where that would happen. So... I, yeah so that that was there was nobody on the long trail didn't run anybody in that section maybe i mean i didn't really have any real contact until i got into um into new hampshire uh, i found like the last airbnb i i forget what the name of the town is but uh yeah it was like the last airbnb that was open because mm-hmm. like, everything mm-hmm. was closed typically mm-hmm. um but yeah it, it does take a toll on you like it plays with your mind but I also listen to a lot of podcasts and audiobooks. So oh, yeah. 
you know, I got that, you know, I'm not just sitting in my head all day. Like, I don't do that. And even in a good year, like, you know, I just listen to podcasts and audiobooks all day. Yeah. Yeah. What, uh, what was your podcast? What, what was the one that you kept going back to? Well, um, there was a pretty neat one about uh, Theranos, you know, Elizabeth uh, Holmes, who did the blood testing machine that was totally just not real. Um, there's a great book called Super Pumped, which is about the rise of uh, uh, Uber and how you know, that guy is just crazy. Um, mm-hmm. So I enjoyed that. I'm a, I'm a big political junkie too. So there's a lot of political podcasts, um, some uh, history ones, uh, history that doesn't suck. They talked about the entire, in pretty good detail, the entire history of um, the Civil War. Learned oh, wow. a lot of things about that that I hadn't known before. Um, yeah, and other just random things. A lot of sports too. You know, got to yep. keep up on that, even though there wasn't much. <laughs> right, right. There's, there's still not a whole lot of sports happening. Yeah, but we got football back, so I'm excited about that. Yeah, they'll be they'll be fun to watch. They got fake people in the stands, right? They, I don't. It, it, they do for baseball, which yeah. is they have like cutouts of people, which is yeah. hilarious, and then they. They don't pump in sound, but I think in, I don't know how it all works. I know in the NBA and their bubble, they have like screen set up of people like Zoom calls in to, to watch the game. But then some of their heads are really big and some of them are tiny because they're not like some people like sitting real close to their mm-hmm. camera mm-hmm. and some of the people are set far away. So it's, it's entertaining. Oh, wow. Well, so, okay. So you're done with the trail. Any big hikes coming up next? Well, my plans uh in the short term is i got a lot more content to put out on my blog mm-hmm. just you know like the gear review stuff but i want to shape things a little bit different um i have to get a job i'm an architect in the real world uh so i'm working on that right now next summer i'm hoping to it's a couple different things either do uh, a yo-yo attempt of the pnt oh wow which hasn't been done before really so, yeah, nobody's done it. i know people have tried but they haven't. Now, are you hiking? Work. Are you hiking the new PNT or the old PNT? The easiest route of the PNT. Okay. Because okay. I've done some of the alternate routes of the PNT yeah. when last year when I did it, and it was super fucking hard. Yeah. Uh, so, and there's a reason why some of the routes go a different way now than before. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, there's some uh, th- that would be a really technical hike because the weather window is so small, anyways. Oh yeah. Um, but I think it's possible. I think I, I got a way to be able to do it. You just have to really push that window and be prepared for some crazy weather. Uh, the other thing is I might uh, just do the CDT. Um, mm-hmm. I don't particularly like the idea of doubling up on a trail. Um, so that's why I might not do the yo-yo, the PNT. Uh, CDT, you know, basically finish up uh, the Triple Crown. I wanted to do the CDT for a long time. Oh yeah. Um, there's, another, there's another trail called the Great Divide Trail. Yep. Um, basically Canada. The, the CDT of Canada. That's yep. short. That's like 700 miles. That looks pretty awesome. Uh, and or I might just go finish the uh, the Appalachian Trail, but then do the north the the north section of the International Appalachian Trail. Mm-hmm. So Gut Hook just came out with a map set for that section. Okay. So that would make navigation pretty easy. So I could knock two birds out or one bird out with two. Whatever. I could knock that out and, uh, you know, that would be fun. Uh, A couple different options. Yeah. Have you heard of the Idaho Centennial Trail? Yes, I have heard. I was just about to say, you know, (laughs) I've watched the videos and that that. So when I was researching uh, PNT stuff, like I came across your guys' blog. I was like, oh, that that looks pretty awesome. And that looks like it goes through some pretty great terrain. Yeah. Um, Yeah. yeah, if you if you like the Appalachian Trail but didn't didn't like the fact that there was a trail to follow, but you really enjoyed the no switchbacks and the dense vegetation, then definitely Ida Centennial Trail. That's yeah. A, how's the how's the bushwhacking yeah. through for that? Is there oh, five just... hundred miles of it? Yeah. <laughs> five, well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there, there's bushwhacking on the PNT that I just wanted to you know, like throw myself off a cliff. But yeah, um, yeah. No, all those trails sound great. Uh, I I did the northern half of the CDT, and uh, it was insane. So, 
you know, if you're looking for votes, I would vote for you to do the CDT. Um, I would keep that in mind. Yeah, that that would actually be pretty fun too, because nobody's, I mean, besides you guys, I mean, it's not really a known trail and, you know, I, I, I like exposing other people to new things. Oh yeah. And uh, like, I, I was the first, I don't think there's anybody else who have blogged a full attempt, uh, first of a calendar year triple crown and second mm -hmm. doing the PCT and the AT in one year, which I actually think is pretty manageable to do those two trails and i'd like to see more people do it and so maybe that excites other people like yeah i can try that you yeah know, doing you know you, uh the idaho you said centennial idaho centennial yeah, yeah. yeah idaho centennial trail like people don't know about it i get on it and you know get people excited about it and exactly. you know, more awareness for the trail is means uh you know future longevity so you feel what you film like every day you got a video going on the site? I, every second, yeah, I mean, yeah, I would film every day. Yeah. Um, it's a comb it's kind of like, it's framed as my personal diary, well, not per diary uh, and sharing it with other people. So okay. I wasn't, I'm not doing it for the, I'm not doing it for the likes per se. Not yeah. Not, not for the fame. Uh, I have enjoyed, you know, people uh, recognize me on trail. I mean, it's, I don't know, it's not like I have a cute, not like the, some of the other people who have thousands of followers and things like that. But, you know, I've had people say like, they've really enjoyed watching the videos and they can't hike, but they like watching my hike. Mm -hmm. um, and for me personally, it's better than just taking pictures. Because mm -hmm. pictures only show that one frame. Mm -hmm. so you have a video of it, a video record. And uh, to me, it's been a lot more fulfilling, especially when I go back and watch them, some of them, like going over Mount Washington in winter. I was like, whoa. I don't know about that. That was super sketchy. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's exciting watching that kind of stuff. Or like at the very beginning versus the end and how much I've changed over that time. Mm -hmm. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. All right. So if somebody wants to follow you, what's your Instagram? It's uh, S underscore S dot Sullivan. Okay. And uh, then on YouTube, there is a, there's a link in my Instagram bio that'll take mm -hmm. you to it. Or uh, the YouTube channel is called Rock, Flag, and Hike. Okay. Um, you can just search that in or, you know, plug that in. You should be able to find it. Yeah, hell yeah. And I'll put all those uh, links in the description too. So cool. we'll get you some backlinks there. All right, Sean. Well, again, great talking to you. Thanks for doing this. And uh, good yeah. luck out here in Portland and uh, looking for some work. I hear the economy's turning around. So eh, it's not so bad, yeah. depending on what your job is. That's actually mm -hmm. the big part of it right cool yeah thanks i appreciate the talk uh yeah